the Seven Trumpets Prepper. And ladies and gentlemen, in this video today, I'm going to present to you, is your pastor a wolf in sheep's clothing? They are if they don't teach you these truths. Now, I'm going to go through, I think, about 24 different points today, uh, 20 of them mission critical and four of them what I would consider honorable mentions in these last days. Um, this video is going to be very controversial and very hard hitting. I make no apologies for the content that I'm about to share with you today, and I encourage you to seek these things out to see if they be so. With that said, I'm going to go through these slides one after another, and I encourage you to take a pen and paper, make notes, because the honest heart is going to need to definitely um, break some of this stuff down later and study uh, as I go through it. Uh, please keep in mind that there's a lot of good, honest people out there, especially ministers, teachers, that they mean well. They just don't know some of these truths. Um, but the time comes whenever you have the opportunity to learn those truths and you choose not to share that with those that you're being a shepherd to, um, then that comes to the point where that you are a wolf in sheep's clothing. And once again, I make no apologies for that statement either. Uh, so with that said, I'm going to go through this, and I hope that it is a viral call to you. Um, you know, last year, or this, yeah, actually on the pagan year, uh, we done a ministry conference, invited a lot of speakers from around the country uh, to speak. I've tried to do some things with the funds that come in on this channel. Um, please like, share, and subscribe if you're not a uh, subscriber on this channel. For those that would like to donate and support the work I do on this channel, links are in the video description below. Um, like I said, this past year, I was able to put on a ministry conference. I'm going to try to do some meetups this year, uh, if possible, y'all willing. Um, the wrong of things really messed up a lot, folks. So point number one. <clears throat> this is very mission critical for the time that we're living in right now because in Genesis 6 and 9, in the King James Version, where I've, uh, a lot of these uh, scripture quotes, they have the set-apart names restored for respect the Most High on His Son, says here, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with Elohim. Now, this is important to understand because in the last days we're living in, right here, it's just like a Noah's day. Not only was he an upright man, righteous, right? But he was perfect in his generations, his DNA. Okay, if you look at this, right? Now, the thing is, is as of... The days of Noah, so shall come the Son of Man be, right? Well, if you look at this graph right here, this is a representation of a six-foot man in modern day all the way up to like 650 B.C. to 640 A.D., somewhere around here. You have this 36-foot giant. You have all these different variations of giants um, that we, that's that been found. Uh, not only that, but they pointed out, you know, over time, Smithsonian always seems to show up, dis make this stuff disappear. But if you read in Genesis 6 and 4 in the KJV, it says there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of Elohim came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were old of old men of renown. Now, if you look at what Mashiach said, what Messiah said here in Matthew 24, verses 37 through 39, in the King James Version, it says, but as of the days of Noah, were so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. This is very important that we understand this because as of the days of Noah, we are approaching that at light speed um, in these last days with all the um, nanotechnology, transhumanism, everything that's trying to be put into our beings and corrupt us. I think that uh, with all my heart, I believe it, that it's for the full intent to try to make us damaged so that, uh, you know, we're like the fallen before the flood. But in verse 38 says, For as in the days, in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until a flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And ladies and gentlemen, people are asleep at the wheel in this last generation. Uh, no doubt about it. Point number two. If your pastor is not teaching against sin, he's a wolf in sheep's clothing. Because right here, the definition, if you Google the definition of sin, literally states, that it is a noun, an immoral act considered to be a transgression against the divine law. Ladies and gentlemen, a lot of pastors nowadays, um, they, they preach these prosperity gospels, feel-good speeches, but if they're not teaching against sin, they're a false shepherd. 
1 John 3 and 4, Whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law, for the sin is the transgression of the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Right there you go. For sin is the transgression of the law. It's that plain and simple. And I, there's no particular order all these points that I put in today. I'm just trying to go from a baseline from if somebody wasn't a believer, uh, they seeing this, how what would you want to look for? And, you know, the next step is what brought me out of Babylon by the grace of the Most High Yah. Many pastors today teach that the divine law has been done away with. However, the law is eternal. Not only that, but the, the law that was engraved on the sapphire stones and handed to Moshe on the mount. If we look at it in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through 20 in the King James Version, states, Think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I have come, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one title shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. All is not been fulfilled yet. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> Excuse me. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter in to the kingdom of heaven. Now, there's a lot of pastors today that are not teaching all the commandments. Not only that, they will flat out, like when it comes to the Sabbath, uh, encourage people to keep the Roman calendar, um, and we can just go into so much more, and we will as we go through these points, but it's very important to understand that the law has never been done away with. Furthermore, in Jeremiah, prophet Yeremiahu, in the 31st chapter and the 33rd verse says, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith Yahuwah. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their Elohim and they shall be my people. That's King James Version with respect to the set part names restored in it. We'll get into the set part names here in a little bit. It's so important to understand, ladies and gentlemen, because the law is supposed to be wrote in our heart. And, you know, whether you're like me of the nations that's, uh, you know, decided to keep the commandments, serve the Most High Yah and cleave to the house of Israel, or if you are a uh, descendant of Abraham in the house of Israel, it, this is where the law goes, inside your heart, inside your inward parts. Number four, we're moving on. Many people, this is crazy, but it's happening in the last generation. Many are teaching that Messiah, to dismiss Messiah. However, I mean, I'm talking everything that pertains to Messiah, practically. But... The scripture plainly says that those of us that will make it into the kingdom by the grace of Yah, it says here in Revelation 12, chapter 12, verse 17, in the King James Version. I'm using the King James Version because I know a lot of people that are trying to study the word right now use the KJV. I use the Etzefer or the Hallelujah Scriptures Bible, but the KJV is what we use, I'm using today for this presentation to help enlighten you. King James Version says in 17, uh, or 12th chapter, 17th verse, And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of Elohim, and have the testimony of Yahashua HaMashiach. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of Elohim and the faith of Yahushua. Revelation 22 and 14. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. Please keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, the set apart names are uh, the transliterated set apart names are restored into that res with respect to the Most High Yah and His Son. Number five, if your pastor is not teaching you the set apart names, he is probably a false shepherd and a wolf in sheep's clothing. J C. Okay, that you uh, anybody that doesn't know the abbreviation J C. Okay that many of the church house today use the G-O-D and J-C. But however, the Messiah's name is Yahushua. It means literally, Yah is salvation. And right here it says in Acts 4 and 12, this is a Hallelujah Scriptures uh, 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 print that I used here, for example, that right here they had put in there. And there is no deliverance in anyone else, for there is no other name under the Shamayim, under the heavens above, given among men by which we need to be saved. Yahushua, it literally, when you call upon his name, you're literally, that's saying, Yah is salvation. And right here, Yahweh, okay, if you break this down, if you can see on my shirt today, the Father's name in Paleo-Hebrew, right here it is in Paleo-Hebrew. 
hand behold the nail behold. I mean, literally, you can see in the names the point to salvation. It, it's so important, okay, because the world has covered that up. And many pastors will know these names, but yet they'll use the false names along with it and, and mix in the holy with the profane. Uh, and that's exactly what was warned about in the scripture too, that the pastors have done this. Now, <clears throat> if we look at the King James Version Bible, just it alone, many people say, well, don't use the Father's name, Yah, because, you know, that, where did you make that up? Well, actually, remnants of this information is still preserved in the scripture, thankfully. If you look in the King James Version, in Psalm 68, 4, it says, sing unto Elohim, sing praises to his name, extol him that rideth up on the heavens by his name, Yah, and rejoice before him. Now, something interesting to understand here is until the 1600s, there was no J in the English language. So we either have to replace that with an I or a Y, which the proper usage should be a Y, especially looking at the Hebrew. So here we have an example clear as day that the Father's name, at least the beginning of it, is Yah. This is so important to understand because many are in error to this today. And many will not even acknowledge the Father's name, yet it's preserved right here an example in the King James Version Bible. Now this one's an interesting too because Isaiah 42 and 8 states, I am, that should be Yahuwah. But they replaced it many, many times throughout the scripture with the Lord. All right, I'm not going to call upon B-A-A-L because that's pretty much exactly what you're doing. And Father, please forgive me for even stating that. But the thing is here is if you replace that back with Yahuwah, you can plainly see that that should be in respect to him because it says if you replace that, I am Yahuwah, that is my name, and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. We're only to worship the Father. It's that simple. Messiah plainly pointed out that the Father was greater and he also. Now, point number six, moving forward. Many churches today don't make baptism an important factor. You know, many fellowships today, I don't understand what the problem is, um, and it's not so much in the Torah community as it is in the world, but this is still a critical part of our faith. Matter of fact, it plainly states in Romans, therefore we were buried with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Messiah was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so too may walk in a new way of life. This is a billboard to the world of a conversion to, to honor the Father. Number seven, if your pastor is teaching spiritism, cut them loose. Many people today go to a funeral and their loved ones are in the grave. Then they're up in the heavens above, relaxing. Then they're in the grave. Then they're in the heavens above. It's up, down, up, down, up, down throughout a funeral. But yet the scripture is very clear where your loved ones are. Ecclesiastes 9 and 5 in the King James Version Bible, unedited. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more reward for the memory of them is forgotten. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. This one from Messiah himself, John chapter 5, Johannine's writing says here in the 28th uh, verse of chapter 5, Do not be amazed at this, for the air is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. However, ladies and gentlemen, many pastors will teach right contrary to that, but if they are teaching spiritism, you need to cut them off. Point number eight. Many people are confused on marriage today, and especially the world has compounded this. Today, we see people marrying animals, which is bestiality, which is completely sin. We see people marrying uh, man to man, woman to woman, which is considered homosexuality, which is considered abomination in the scripture. We see people marrying their own family members, which is incestuous, which is absolutely a sin. And then on top of that, we see child pedophilia, which is absolutely wickedness. Now, what the scripture actually details out is eight different variations of marriage. And I'm going to break this down very quickly, though, for those that are confused. The nuclear family which results with one man and one woman. We can see this throughout the pages of Scripture, and I see no reason to go further into it, but if you're curious, the first example is in Genesis 2 and 24. Number two, if a man had a brother, and he passed away and had no seed, then the, the brother was to marry that woman, and the woman was to submit to him sexually. 
and produce a seed to that man. This is found in Genesis 38, verses 6 through 10, an example. Moving on, example number three. A man has a wife, then he receives concubine uh, to go along with that. Abraham is an example of this that took place. Number four, which is a terribly sad situation, but it is described in Deuteronomy 20, uh, 2, verses 28 through 29, the situation between a rapist and his victim. Number five is Genesis 16, a man and a woman and the woman's property. This is an example of a situation in marriage. Number six, if a man went to war and he killed his enemies and he took the virgin woman that had never lain with a man, this was an example in Numbers 31, verses 1 through 18, Deuteronomy 21, 11 through 14. Number seven, polygyny. Oh boy, woo, people get bit up on this one. Uh, but let's just go through a few that had multiple wives. Lamech, Esau, Jacob, Asher, Gideon had many. Uh, Elkanah, David, Solomon, 700 wives. Uh, Rehoboam, uh, Abiyah, Jeroboam, Yahash, Ahab, Yechelon, and Belshazzar. This is some example right here of polygyny. Ladies and gentlemen, I assure you this will be the future um, because that Many, many men nowadays have become effeminate due to GMOs and uh, the media programming and so many other sad situations. But this is pointed out that later down the line, and I believe in the book of Isaiah, just off the top of my head right now, that many will want to be cleaved to a man later down the road and be called by his name uh, to take away their reproach. This is an example of what is to come. You just sit back and watch. And the last example is a male slave and a female slave in the scripture having a uh, relationship, Exodus 21, and verses, uh, verse 4. So there's some examples of what the actual, the scripture lays out as uh, intimate relationships, okay? And approved relationships, I might also add. Um, the only situation that's out there on the fringe is the rapist with his victim. Very, very sad situation, but the scripture details how to handle that situation. Uh, but anyway, like many are confused today. Homosexuality is not found in the scripture. Bestiality is not found in the scripture. Pedophilia is not found in the scripture. Um, although you can take a young wife, there is a point where a person is a child and then there's a point where a person is a young woman uh, or a young man for that example. But it's very, very clear the scripture lays this out and you do not hear nowadays marriage being explained clear enough uh, from the scripture, and not only that, you see so many pastors supporting homosexuality and all sorts of craziness when the scripture's right against it. So there's that one, that point. Number nine, moving on. When I was a child, I seen this picture often in my SU in day school class before I left that to walk in the way, or actually I went to Seventh-day Adventist Church and then left that to walk in the way and keep the Torah and the commandments. Now, this is an example of a picture of the rapture. You have a false messiah here because the true messiah is a melanated man. We'll get into that in a minute. Um, but as you look at this pictorial, you see all these people just whisking away. Now, however, others are seeing this take place, right? Um, from what you can see here, people, I think there's a man in here somewhere in a car leaning out, shaking his fist, but it's not very clear right now. Um, but anyway, this is another one. People just the secret rapture being disappeared away. Many pastors teach a rapture doctrine, pre-tribulation, uh, it, it's, it's huge, especially in the SUN day church nowadays. Um, but the scripture is plain. It says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and ever eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, uh, so be it. I'll just say so be it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm still torn on the A-M-E-N situation. It says here, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith Yahuwah, which is, uh, I'm sorry, that which should be, um, Actually, that right there, where they replaced that Lord, that should be Mashiach, I believe. Anyways, which is to come, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Right here, here's the situation. All eyes will see him when they when he comes, okay? Moving forward, number 10. They don't teach you about the seven trumps of Revelation. This whole channel started because of seven trumps of Revelation, seven trumps of prayer, that's the name of the channel. But they will not teach you this. Many churches will stay quiet because, oh, it's too hard to understand, or... Don't worry about it. It's not our generation. But yet, this is about to explode right in front of our face. I shared recently on the channel about that movie Greenland, that if you viewed it, um, it the, the first three trumpets, it really gave you a pictorial example kind of, of how the first three trumpets would play out. A, a, a good visualization. This is to come, ladies and gentlemen. This is 
This is most likely going to happen in our very generation, and I'll give you more examples as to why I've led to believe that. But many pastors will not teach the final events. They will not teach the last days. They will not teach the biblical prophecy of the end days. If they're not teaching that, cut them loose. Number 11, the eight kings of Revelation. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space, and the beast that was, and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. I have done a whole video presentation about this. If you'd like to view it below in the link in the video description. It is very imperative that we understand this because in 1922, from the Lateran Treaty to now, the Vatican has a kingdom. You can see her arrayed in the gold and the scarlet. Let me move forward. And the purple. This is the great whore of Babylon, the Roman Catholic Church. The man of sin in her head. Another thing that we see nowadays is the Antichrist. We hear about Antichrist, Antichrist, Antichrist. But John speaks of many Antichrists have gone out in the world, right? We're looking for the man of sin. And Thessalonians, you know, the one that would set upon in the, the house of Elohim as if he is Elohim, right? Well, here's the man of sin that we're looking for. And in the last day, Pope Francis, this man of sin right here, ladies and gentlemen, is of the eight, okay? He's actually, there's two pontiffs still alive right now, which, you know, if you look in 2 Astras, I believe it is, um, there's, there's plenty of prophecy about these individuals. And it's very important, like I said, that you view that video that I made about these eight kings. If your pastor is not calling, <coughs> excuse me, calling out the man of sin, you need to definitely be concerned. All right, and I know many of us that were former Seventh-day Adventists are very awake to what's going on in that situation now. Number 12, <clears throat> they don't teach you the appointed feasts. Now, there's many pastors out here in the way nowadays that they will teach you all about the appointed feasts of y'all. Hey, they'll even tell you to keep the Father's calendar to keep these. They'll even acknowledge the new moon, how that it's found by the Father's calendar. But yet they will, just like this nice little put-together sheet, Keep the Shabbat by the S-A-T-U-R-N day. And I will show you here in a minute that S-A-T day has never been the Sabbath throughout eternity. Okay, it's just another arbitrary pagan day on the Roman calendar. <clears throat> because the statement has always been made that S-A-T day has always been the Sabbath. And I'm going to disprove that today in a heartbeat. Um, but moving forward, if your pastor's not teaching you about the feast, if he's not teaching you about how to calculate the new moon, if he's not teaching you about when Sabbath is, then you need to do something serious about removing yourself from that situation. The WorldsLastChance.com has a great calendar app that you can get for free on the App Store, Android, or um, Apple that helps you to find these appointed times, okay? Uh, because one funny thing in the Torah community and um, in, in the community that's in the way is that nobody's in argument about when the feast is. You can pretty much find everybody together on feast day. It's just as soon as that's over, people go right down the path of SAT Day Worship, or they go back over here and keep the Father's calendar continuous by his loony solar uh, uh, scriptural calendar set in the firmament dome above. In the heavens, we'll talk about flat earth shortly. Number 13, the mark of the beast. Ladies and gentlemen, the Pope, the Roman Catholic Church states that the SUN day worship is the mark, their mark of authority. Also their calendar. Furthermore, America, which is the second beast of Revelation, if you continue to study prophecy, first beast of Revelation, the Roman Catholic Church, second beast is America. If you look at this, America made it a mandate and a rule that only treaties signed with the world had to be signed using the Gregorian calendar dates, making an image to the beast. Now, the Father's calendar is very simple. I'll go over this in a minute. Please don't dismiss this because I promise you I'll make my case for it in a moment. But the forced worship is coming. Everyone either worships nowadays on the SUN day or the SAT day on the pagan Roman calendar. But yet the Father's calendar is laid out in Scripture. He requires us to worship Him on His Sabbath day. Number 14, going further into this, Malachi 3 and 6 states in the King James Version Bible with the set-apart names restored, For I am Yahuwah, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Now, what you see before you is a fasty calendar of Rome, okay? Right here, you would see Settivano. This is uh, pretty much right here, uh, if I have found all my stuff correctly on this particular calendar. This would be the feast of what they would say, S-A-T-U-R-N, Analia, instead of the 
Christmas that we have right now. This would be where people would participate in all sorts of debauchery, homosexuality, um, and just terrible, terrible acts, which now people celebrate as Christmas. This here, you can find it still on the Roman calendar there, uh, where they worship false deities and etc. And you can see uh, Caesars and stuff marked off. Well, this is a clear example of this because it was A through H. You can see the run through the calendar, A through H. This was the original lunisolar pagan Roman eight-day calendar of Rome. Now, as you can see, there's also not a SAT day, okay? And I try not to say the pagan days of the week. That's why I do that, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> to honor the Father, because we're not supposed to take the name of false deities into our tongue, into our mouths, and say it. So the thing is, is when you look up on this calendar, what you see right then and there is that somebody's lying, and many pastors are lying, saying SAT day has always been the Sabbath. This is disveiled in point exhibit one right here. I would submit to you, the, to you, the court today. But furthermore, compounding the problem is, as you can see here, this is the false deity of S-A-T-U-R-N. All right, well, if you notice, he's in the first position of the week. This is the um, stick calendar. You can find an example of this on the Baths of Titus in Rome. The S-U-N day deity is in the secondary position. Now, what happened is, is eventually S-A-T-U-R-N day got the boot all the way to the end of the week, where that it was the seventh day of the week, uh, and uh, the S-U-N day deity got the prominence of the first day of the week worship, because um, sun worship became very prominent. So, actually, you see, that's in two examples that your pastor lied to you, because S-A-T-U-R-N is not always being the seventh day of the week. And furthermore, it's only the seventh day of the week on the pagan Roman calendar. Uh, now, here's another situation. is ten days was lost whenever they went from the Julian to the Gregorian calendar. Now, a situation also happened on timetables back in the day, uh, like this, happened forward motion in, uh, I think it was 2011, uh, Samoa, had a time zone change situation, and what had happened is it messed up a whole day. They lost like a day in time. Well, the Seventh Day Adventist Church had a situation where they either had to choose to do SUN Day to keep going seven 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 now, or stick with SAT, and so it, it caused a big division in the Seventh Day Adventist Church. And when you keep the Father's Lunar Solar Scriptural Calendar in the sky, you don't have these problems. Okay, but here's another example right here: time differences. Now the Father's calendar is real simple. If you look in Ezekiel chapter 46, verse 1, there's new moon days, Sabbath days, and work days. New moon day always signals the beginning of a month. You have four complete sets of weeks, and then it's either ends in the 29-day month or a 30-day month. So you have like, some people count that as an additional new moon day. Some people call it a translation day. Regardless, the month starts over. This pattern you see, 8, 15, 27, 29 days, also Anytime you see a time date stamp signature in scripture, always falls upon those dates. Now, the thing is, is many will dismiss me, and I want to make sure my picture's right here where you can see my face very clear. Many of you will dismiss me. Many will dismiss those of us that keep the Father's counter, but you cannot beat this equation I'm about to give you, except if you have the Father's calendar in hand. Now, when ancient Israel, okay, went around Jericho, <clears throat> There was a situation that happened that they commenced war for seven days. Now, I'm going to prove to you that the Father has a calendar that Rome cannot emulate, okay? Because on the Father's calendar is the only way you can battle for seven days and not profane his calendar. So let us begin. If you look in the book of Yasher, chapter 88, it says, And Jericho was entirely closed up against children of Israel. No one came out or went in. And it was in the second moon, on the first day of the moon, that Yahuwah said to Yohasha, Rise up, behold, I have given Jericho into thy hand, with all the people thereof, and all your fighting men shall go around the city once each day, thus shall you do for six days. And the priests shall blow upon trumpets, and when you shall hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall give a great shouting, that the walls of the city shall fall down. All the people shall go up, every man against his opponent. And Yohasha did so according that all Yahuwah had commanded him. And on the seventh day, they went around the city seven times, and the priests blew upon trumpets. And at the seventh round, Yohasha said to the people, Shout, for Yahuwah has delivered the whole city into our hands. Now, many would be like, well, the Most High can change his rules and things like that. But we've seen right there, it says that I change not. So there has to be an explanation of how that we're going to have these mathematics. Well, 
they walked around on New Moon Day, and then six work days, they proceeded to do this event. So let's backpedal for a minute. There was New Moon Day, they walked around, and then that come up to day six, because there you have six days they walked around. Then the seventh day, which was actually the sixth day of the work week, because we have New Moon Day, then six working days, they were at the end of the week. The following day would have been Sabbath. Now, do we have proof that this is accurate, right? Oh, I have multiple witnesses. In Maccabees chapter 2, they pursued after them a great number, and having overtaken them, they camped against them and made war against them on the Sabbath day. This is, please keep in mind, this is during the Grecian era in the book of Maccabees, right? And they said unto them, Let that which ye have done hitherto suffice. Come forth and do according to the commandment of the king, and ye shall live. But they said, We will not come forth, neither will we do the king's commandment to profane the Sabbath day. So then they gave, uh, sorry, cut out right there where I added that text yet, yeah, but verse 36, continue forward. How be it they answered them not, neither cast they a stone at them, nor stopped the places where they laid hid. But said, let us die all in our innocency. Heaven and earth will testify for us that ye put us to death wrongfully. So they rose up against them in battle on the Sabbath day, on the Sabbath, and they slew them with their wives and children and their cattle to the number of a thousand people. Now when Matthias... And his friends understood thereof, hereof, they mourned for them right sore. And one of them said to another, If we all do as our brethren have done, and fight not for our lives and laws against the heathen, they will go now quickly, root us out of the earth. Continue. Please get ready for this one. <clears throat> Verse 41. At that time. So up until then, but at that time, at this point in the Grecian era, so long past Aaron and Moses, long past Israel's day of glory, but forward, okay? At that time, in the Grecian era, right there, okay? At that time, therefore they decreed, saying, whosoever shall come to make battle with us on the Sabbath day, we will fight against him. So they weren't fighting up until that point, ladies and gentlemen. So we know those days in Jericho that was fought were not none of them the Sabbath, furthermore vindicating the Father's counter. Says here, neither will we die all as our brethren that were murdered in the secret places. Now, another witness. You say, look, well, maybe something was just a mess here. Was it? Because Jubilees chapter 50, verse 12 starting says, And every man who does any work thereon, or goes a journey, or tills his farm, whether in his house or any other place, and whoever lights a fire, or rides on any beast, or travels by ship on the sea, and whoever strikes or kills anything, or slaughters a beast or a bird, or whoever catches an animal or a bird or a fish, or whoever fasts, or makes war on the Sabbaths. The man who does any of these things on the Sabbath shall die. Now, uh, and, it, and it goes further. So that the children of Israel shall make observe, uh, so the children of Israel shall observe the Sabbaths according to the commandments regarding the Sabbaths of the land, as it is written in the tablets which you gave into my hands that I should write out for thee, the laws of the seasons and the seasons according to the visions of their days. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I make my case. A father's calendar is the only one to keep. I've shown you that the Roman one is, is, is just garbage. I've shown you that the only way to work out this equation right here, and this is just one example, that the only way to work this equation out is to use father's calendar. So any pastor that dismisses this, dismisses me, dismisses the fact that this, this can be found, and you can search this out to see if it'd be so immediately right now, they're a false pastor. Okay, that's all there is to it. They're denying the truth. They're hiding it from you. They're just a false, uh, uh, a wolf in sheep's clothing. That's all there is to it. Number 15. Now, this is a statue of an ancient Hebrew Israelite from the tribe of Yehuda in the year AD 70. Does he look like the Jewish people that are in Israel today? He says, I will let you be the judge of that. If you notice, look at this higher texture. Okay, look at the melanation. Look at the facial structure and the ridge here above the eyes. Now, I'm not, a, I'm not a doctor, but I'm just saying, I can walk out on the street and pick you somebody out like this today, and it's not the people that's in the land of Israel today. This is a true Hebrew Israelite, right? Now, many will reject the black Hebrew Israelite, and please note that just because you're black don't make you a Hebrew Israelite. You could be a Hamite. You, you could actually, your father could have been white or Asian or Hispanic or something else, and even though you look melanated and look like the Hebrew Israelites, you may actually be the son of a stranger. So, you know, we all need to be humble and serve the Father. That doesn't make you, uh, you know, 
I want to be careful how I say this because it's like we all, if we don't keep the commandments and fear Messiah, we're going to be on the outside of the kingdom anyway. But to be honest to the truth, to be honest to history, to be honest to prophecy about the last days, if you go check this video out, it's about to, it's close to rolling a million views that I put out there. The true Hebrew Israelites defined by scripture and history warning you will be shocked. If you view this presentation, it will take you through systematically. And this was done, what year are we in? It's like seven years ago, I guess, now at this point. On, or it's going on seven years ago. I produced this film, this little mini documentary. It's 22 minutes, 55 seconds long. This will take you step by step through ancient Hebrew Israelites forward. Uh, I wish that I had known now then the stuff that I know now because <laughs> I would have put even more content in there. But ladies and gentlemen, if your pastor's not teaching who the true Hebrew Israelites and covering up, he's a false pastor, he's a wolf in sheep's clothing because these people are defined in the scriptures. Very simple, okay? Moving on, point number 16. If your pastor is not teaching the true nature of the Father's art world, he's a false pastor. Wolf in sheep's clothing, if he knows this. Because the firmament, it says here, and Elohim made the firmament divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. If you look up firmament, it is literally a beaten work, I believe is the word that's described in the Hebrew tongue. I should have put it up here for him. But literally, this is the world that we live in, an example of it, uh, kind of a visualization. There's waters above, waters below, right? As thou with him spread out the sky, which is strong and is a molten looking glass. That first scripture I read was in Genesis 1, 7. That second one was in Job 37 and 18. And the stars of the heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. That's Revelation 6, 13. He set the earth on its foundations that it should never be moved. Psalms 104 and 5. Yet we're supposed to be spinning thousands of miles an hour through the, the, the space and stuff. Who do you trust? NASA, one of the biggest purchasers of uh, CGI equipment and etc. cetera, um, filmmaking junk to make this false garbage. Or are you going to trust the Bible, biblical cosmology and what we see here in reality? Okay? It's real simple. Now, there is a flatearthdoctrine.com. You check this out, man. There is a, buz, I mean, just bukus, uh, tons of scripture about, you know, that the earth has corners, uh, firm, it's, it's fixed and immovable, uh, you know, uh, the water straight, not curved. Uh, oh, my goodness, you know, that it has a uh, borders around it. I mean, it, there's just so much that you can look this up in the scripture. Um, you know, Isaiah, if you look it up, you know, that the, the, the world's a deist, not a ball. Because it's funny because in Isaiah, he goes on to say they'll toss the like a ball into a foreign country because, you know, worship false images. And literally, you can see the difference between disc and ball in Isaiah. Number 17 is if your pastor is not teaching you that aliens, what you see is this garbage, is actually demons and this deception that's going to take place with this whole alien invasion into a globe earth garbage, they're not teaching you this, they're a false shepherd. This right here, Aleister Crowley, which is one of the most occultist, wicked people that's ever lived, probably advocated the use of cocaine and LSD to come into union with Lucifer and to better understand it. While performing black magic rituals, Crowley would take LSD and would see the entity Lom, which result, uh, resembles our modern-day gray alien. Crowley said this was Lucifer. Please note the elongated head. Look at this facial structure. This this is what many say, you know, uh, we, we see as the gray aliens and crazy stuff like that. Look at this entity. This is what the, the occultist sadist seen. All right, so there's what a demon, there's an example, a visualization of a demon. And look how just sickening those eyes are, man. Ugh, just, ugh. But anyway, if they're not telling you those warnings, because when the trumpets start, we're going to see a lot of this in the near future, okay? Point number 18, if they're not telling you the new kingdom's going to be right here on earth, everybody wants to go to heaven. I want to go to earth. I like it here. I want the heavens to come to me. And that's exactly what's going to happen in scripture. The new kingdom will be here up on earth. And another thing is, is uh, you know, geometrical proportions on it. If you look equal on all sides, all right, well, you can have this situation happen with a pyramid. You can have the situation happen with a square, with a cube, right? So I really think because Satan tries to emulate the Most High I think that people will lose their mind when they see this pyramid coming down because the, Satan's tried to get that in the mind that the pyramid, uh, the Illuminati thing, all that, it's wicked, and which, which that entity is. 
But the new kingdom will most likely be a pyramid. I believe that all my heart. So, but if they're, regardless of a cube or a pyramid, I'm not saying your pastor is a false pastor because that, if he's not teaching you the new kingdom is coming to earth, then you need to get on it. Number 19, right here, as I was just pointing out, look at this pyramid, all seeing eye. This is on a Catholic institution, right? And here you see the Trinity Doctrine, right? Now, there's only one Elohim, ladies and gentlemen, and nothing is new under the sun, or either scripture I'm just saying, but here you see IHS. This is often in a Roman Catholic pagan Roman church, right? IHS stands for these false deities. I'm not going to say their names, but you can see right here, this is Egyptian. You can go further back to Babylonian, but I wanted to stay on point somewhere that would be an easy transitory process because most people in school learn about ancient Egypt. So that would be a transitory process right there. And then you can take those deities and go back further to Babylonia. Now, right here, Ecclesiastes 1 and 9 says, What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. And there you go, folks. Uh, number 20. Eternal burning like of hellfire, the eternal burning of people. You know, it's very interesting to me that uh, suppose that you have two individuals and one no uh, and they went and knocked off a 7-Eleven. The one guy was shot and killed. The other guy died 10 years later. The, both, the one guy started burning immediately in this scenario. The other guy didn't burn until 10 years later. Now, is that justice? Because that was the same crime, but the other person done even more time for the same crime. Now, that's not exactly just. However, if the wicked was raised at a separate resurrection and burnt, then that would make a lot of sense because there'd be no more, right? Well, let's see if we can find something kind of like that in Scripture. Well, Malachi 4, chapter 4, King James Version, and set apart names restored with respect, with respect to the Father and His Son, says, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith Yahuwah of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith... Uh, that, actually, I'm sorry, guys, I, I went to correct that, and I can see right there, saith Yahuwah of hosts, for some reason, I apologize that the correction did not go in there. But remember the, ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Now, there you go, root nor branch. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I hope that part of the presentation has been helpful to you. Um, so many people are operating in error nowadays. They're not telling the truth to their people. Now, the other thing I want to share with you is a couple honorable mentions. Point number 21. Is if I was a pastor um, and I wanted to tell my congregation the truth about stuff, one of the other things I would tell them is don't eat GMOs. You know, you can see when Yohasha went into the promised land, he destroyed a bunch of uh, crops, animals, and hybridized people. This today should not be put in our bodies. Number two, 22, female pastors. Now, I'm not a sexist individual, but there's certain offices in the kingdom and that ladies, it's in this generation, I've never seen women more out of control in the history of humanity than I do in this generation. Not only that with narcissism, psychopathy, sociopathy, um, and the inability to control your emotional outburst. A woman does not need to be in the place of a pastor right now. Now, I stand firmly behind that. Um, I, I'm not going to lie. I used to support women in places of helping building up uh, in, in positions of like pastoral, I guess you would say. But I don't support that at all anymore. I don't because I've seen too many people act out. This is the place for a man. A man has logic and reason and, and, his, and seasoning. And uh, this, I just don't approve of this anymore. So if I was a pastor, uh, your pastor, I'd teach you against that. Point number 23. There's only two genders. Surprisingly, this may come of a shock to some people, but I would also as a pastor teach that there's only two genders um, that, you know, I'm so sick and tired of the gender neutrality and this uh, binary and all this crazy stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, he made the most high, y'all made them male and female, as scripture teaches. Last point of an honorable mention is government is not your Elohim. I will not take their vaccine. I will not worship them. And I refuse to bend my knee to them. And I hope I can die on my feet before I'd ever have to bend my knee. 
But um, there's a time that comes when you should disobey government. There's a time to come when you should obey government. But anything that causes you to offend the Most High Yah's law, just like the three Hebrew children, we should rebel. And as a pastor, I would teach, ladies and gentlemen, this exact point that you should rebel. Now, I want to thank you for viewing the content, and may the Most High be with you and keep you on your journey for truth. I don't profess to know everything, but I pray you please share this with others because somebody shared the truth to me about keeping the Father's commandments so many, many years ago, over a decade ago now. It changed my life fundamentally. I'll praise the Most High. I'll praise the Most High on. And um, not only that, but it shared with me what got started showing me the keeping of the Sabbath, the Ten Commandments, and all this stuff. And ladies and gentlemen, please keep in mind, I was a deacon in a free will Baptist church. So this was a huge shock to me, and I had to really shift gears in my life. Uh, I went from that to a Seventh-day Adventist church, and then from there to keeping the truth and walking in the way. Now, you can see through this presentation where my mentality is today after over a decade. I hope that you will continue to seek out and search the truth out to see if these things be so. All right. Now, uh, please share this content with others. And as always, until we see you again here at Seven Trumpets Prepper Channel, I hope the Most High Yahweh Baruch can keep you, make his face shine upon you, show you favor, and give you shalom, my friends, in Yahushua name.